Hello, everyone. Welcome to ZeroCon21 Partner Channel, hosted by the International Telecommunication Union. My name is Masahito Kawamori. I'm the Rapporteur of ICT Accessibility at ITU, which standardizes, among other things, ICT accessibility. And I'm the moderator of this session today. The title of our session is ICT Accessibility Standards and Policies During and After COVID-19. Before starting our presentations, I would like to invite Mr. Raza Niaz to say a few words on behalf of the Zero Project. Thank you, Masahito. Welcome to your project community. It's a real pleasure to have so many of you with us at this year's Zero Project Conference. With over 4,000 participants online, this year's virtual conference has become a truly global gathering space for those committed to disability inclusion. With so many participants from all over the world, it is easy to forget to mention the backbone of global gatherings like these, namely trusted partner organizations such as ITU and Galaudet. So thank you to ITU and Galaudet for organizing this valuable partner channel session. Therefore, without further ado, I wish you all well. I hope you enjoyed the session and I look forward to seeing you online and in the conference platform. Over to you, Masahito. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Nias. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, then let's start my presentation. I'd like to start my presentation with a list of presenters. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay, so as I said, I'm, I'm the moderator here, Mr. Uh, Dr. Masahito Kamori. We have Ms. Andrea Sachs, Chair of ITU JCAHF, Joint Coordination Activity on Accessibility and Human Factors of ITU. She's also a representative of G3 ICT. We have Mrs. Lydia Best, Duffin, co-vice chair of ITU JCAHF and the chair of National Association of Deafened People, NADP in the United Kingdom. And then we have Dr. Christian Vogler, is deaf, a professor and the director of the Technology Access Program Research Group at Gallaudet University in the United States of America. And then we have Dr. Tom Pei, who is the chairman and managing director of Waymap, chief executive of the Royal Society for Blind Children. He's worked in the area of accessible transport for over 20 years and has supported the development of standards and practical solutions in this area. And lastly, but not least, Dr. Dushan Cha. Saf is he's the director of Digitas Institute and Vice President of the Institute for Integrated Inclusive Communications in the Southeastern Europe, and also a computer science scholar. So these are the presenters today, and I will uh, have their presentations later on. And before that, I would like to have my presentation on the introduction of ITU ICT activities, accessibility activities. Okay, thank you. So International Telecommunication Union is a specialized agency of the United Nations that is responsible for issues that concern information and communication technologies. It is the oldest international organization inheriting the International Telegraph Union, which was established in 1865. And uh, one of the, the famous standards that we standardized is SOS, International Morse Code Distress Signal. And ITU took the prominent role of intergovernment coordination after the Titanic disaster. Next, please. And, um, Especially relevant here now is that COVID-19 is the first pandemic in human history where technology and social media are being used on a massive scale to keep people safe, people safe, productive and connected while being physically apart, which was the statement 
from ITU jointly with WHO. And ICT, Information Communication Technology, is an essential tool in providing vital health information to the wider population. And standards and interoperability are essential in the global setting. And ITU is working with persons with disabilities worldwide to standardize these ICT accessibility technologies. Next, please. Here are some useful ITU standards. We have remote meeting participation standard, standard on captioning. We also have the world's first telephone relay service, including video relay service standard. We have remote sign language interpretation standard. And also we have audio navigation system for visually impaired, which was awarded a zero project prize two years ago. And ITU standards for accessibility are referenced in human rights indicators on the uh, CRPD of the United Nations. Okay, so I would like to stop here and I would like to turn the floor to Ms. Andrea Sachs to speak more about our activities on accessible ICT. Uh, Andrea, please go ahead. Thank you, Masahito. Um, as Masahito says, my name is Andrea Sachs. I lead the work on the ITU Joint Coordination Activity on Accessibility and Human Factors. And I don't think I've got my video on, apologies. Here we go. And um, it has the role of going across the sectors. If I could have the next slide, please. Okay, we have three sectors in the ITU. We have the T sector, which deals in standardization regarding telecommunications and a lot of work that Mr. Masahito has, in fact, illuminated. We also have the R sector, which is the radio and broadcasting sector. And we have the D sector, which is the development sector, uh, which deals with developing countries. So we have three sectors. So what the JCA does is try, because it's basically always try, because we have a different level of awareness with all the different people who participate, some of them new, some of them old, older, um, older members than in the different organizations within the ITU. So we try to get everyone to be on the same page. We also try to get people to use the standards within ITU that we create in the T sector, as well as the ones that we want people outside the ITU. The JCA uh, can communicate with any organization outside of the ITU should they wish to join. The membership is open to anyone. You don't have to be a member of ITU. So the commute, we, we try and work with everyone as best we can, and we hold about we hold two meetings a year, usually co-located, and now of course it will be remote with uh, ITUT, and we're hoping to do one with ITUD and ITUR in the near future. So we also do something extremely important: we include persons with disabilities in our work. They do not have to be a member of ITU; they can simply join. The JCA, which is open to everyone, it is certainly a consumer and an accessibility. Um, oh, I'm, I'm missing a word that I want. It's accessible is what I'm trying to say. Everyone can join and participate. We have a set of terms of reference, which allows us to work across the sectors and explain what I have just said. And the PowerPoint has that linked if should somebody want to look at it. Could I have the next slide? Okay. Now, you can make a contribution to the JCA AHF if you want to, and you don't have to be a member. And you can speak that if you don't wish to write. 
uh, a contribution. And we don't charge you for joining. It's just open to every country and every member of the ITU who wishes to do the work. Now, to subscribe to the JCA, there is on the web page there, which you can also get from um, the web page from the JCA through ITU. Just put in JCA in the ITU web page and you can find us. And the next meeting is going to be on the last week of April 2021. Now, because we can um, work with any group, uh, we put in a list of who we work with. WHO. UNOHCR, CHR, ETSI, ISO, and IEC, W3C, IGF, DICAD, DAISY, World Federation of the Deaf, and the European Federation of the Deaf, and also the International Federation of the Deaf, and the Autistic Min Minority International as well. So you can see we cover everybody and anything. Everybody's welcome. It's a place where you can come and explain what you do, where you help, what your grievances are, and what you would like the ITU and some of these organizations to adopt and work on. And I think we've got one more slide. Or is that it? Is that my last slide? Yep, it is. Now, here is the information of how to reach us. My, um, I have a... Vice Chair, who's going to be speaking also, Miss Lydia Best, who will be speaking also. So we do have something very important, and we have conducted our meeting in accordance with that. Guidelines for accessible meetings. Our meetings are accessible with sign language, captioning, and uh, having people who uh, deal with other issues for accessibility. And then the other thing is, we have written guidelines for supporting remote participation because this also must be accessible for people. And we are demonstrating right now exactly what we are, are preaching in our different um, standards. And now REMPART stands for remote participation in case anybody is wondering. And we constantly update our, our guidelines as technology improves and increases the ability to have more people participate. And since we're remote, we have the world. Well, world can join. We don't have to pay travel expenses anymore. We can join through the internet. So we look forward to having more of you join and participate in the joint coordination activity on accessibility and human factors. Over back to you, Masahito. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's a very good presentation. Now I'd like to invite um, Mrs. Lydia Best. Uh, she's the president of uh, chair of National Association of Deaf and People, NADP. And also she's a co-vice chair of ITU JCA HF, which Andrea just introduced. Okay, over to you, Lydia, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Masahito and Andrea, for such a great introduction to our work at ITU. And I am honored to be able to work with you all and everyone who is coming to ITU. It has been illuminating for myself and for many other people. So I would like to um, introduce the remote participation, the guidelines for supporting remote participation in meetings in for all. It's important to actually realize we have been ahead of time. It, it, the actual technical document has been developed in 2015 and approved. What it does, it specifies the requirements for ensuring that meetings are accessible to all remote participants, people who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, uh, people with cognitive disabilities. Guidance for chairs and moderators. As one of the colleagues who is here today with us has mentioned, technology is 20% and behavior 80%. And often it is especially around the remote participation meetings where the behavior can hinder um, accessibility of the meetings. The guidance is also for participants, such as, for example, making sure that speakers have their videos on. It's not always happening. Guidance on inclusion for, of persons with disabilities and those who are using assistive technologies. 
This specific guidance also helps the developers of uh, participation tools to make sure they understand what we need to include and how we need to watch out for all the different um, um, issues the participants might have using their participation tools. And also there is a guidance on pre-meeting and after meeting actions. So for example, for organizers to understand what we need to provide before the meeting to make sure there is no cognitive overload of the participants, but also um, the provision of transcript, for example, and why it is important. Next slide, please. The second, quite recent, is an overview of re remote captioning. The remote captioning is a technology that allows video presentations to be captioned and in real time from remote location. So these services are usually utilized by the deaf and hard of hearing people, but also for other people, often those for whom um, English, for example, in this case, is second language. The transcribed text is streamed during live meeting like today, we are able to do that. And um, it is using an internet-based platform, but no one misses out on whatever has been said in the meeting. So this is a technical report which outlines clear benefits of remote captioning and captioning in general, defines terminology, various services aspects, and methods of producing captioning. Some are done with re-speaking, some are done using standard typing machines. Then also covers technical aspects of remote captioning equipment, what type of equipment is used to bring to provide output. Data protection and the regulation compliance is also important part of this standard and is important, especially in employment. Um, encryption and security is um, also very, very um, important part of the standard, as well as the standard defines the quality of remote captioning, including minimum accuracy at this point, at this moment in English, but um, of course we welcome the contributions in other languages to ensure that everybody gets the quality of captioning when they need it and, and that is part of the inclusion. This is from me and thank you very much. Over to you Masahito. Thank you, Lydia. That's a very good presentation. And now I'd like to move on to the next presentation to Dr. Christian Vogler, a professor and director of technology access program of Gallaudet University. And he's the technical uh, coordinator of this session. And he has uh, been very helpful in organizing this session itself. And I'd like to thank him personally, as well as Gallaudet University for providing it to such a great uh, uh, technology. Okay, over to you, Christian, please go ahead. Thank you, Masahito. Before I begin, I have a very brief message in sign language. Okay, I'll just say that I feel much more confident in American Sign Language than in international sign, and that is the reason why I'm going to speak for myself. Oh, what I'm going to talk about is work that my research group has done for over 25 years. And in particular, we have been thinking about remote access and online video conferencing for over 10 years. Um, the first part, I'm going to talk about relay services. That's really about how deaf, hard of hearing people and people with speech disabilities can make phone calls. Because obviously that is an important part of the pandemic now, how we can interact with each other when we are working remotely. So the ITU has a functional standard called F.930, which you see on the slide which is the functional description of relay services. 
The basic idea is that belief services are human services mostly that provide a mediation between a person with a hearing or speech disability and a person who is hearing to make sure that they can have access to phone. So the belay service tends to have a human operator in between that translates the communication medium of source to audio and back. For example, sign language to spoken language and vice versa, or text to speech and vice versa. The F930 standard specifies four main types of belay services that I saw on the slide. The first one is captioned telephone belay services that um, shows a phone that looks very much like a regular phone, but it has a screen that shows the captions of what a hearing person is saying. That particular service is appropriate for people who like to speak for themselves, but who might struggle understanding things that are being said over the phone. Okay, the next picture on the top right is an example of video relay services, and that's appropriate for people who use sign language. They talk through a sign language interpreter to the hearing person, through a regular phone call where they have the sign language interpreter on video, and vice versa from spoken language to sign language. The third one. The third one um, on the bottom left is text-based relay services. And I have two examples there, one really old one, which is the TTY, which was um, the old traditional way of making phone calls through, um, through phone line. And then the more modern option, which is real-time text. Um, and that currently is available on iPhones and Android phones in the United States. Either way, the person will type and um, the relay operator will read the text to the hearing person and vice versa, what the relay operator hears will type it back in text. Okay, and the last one on the bottom right is for people who have both a motor and a speech disability that prevents them from speaking clearly and that also prevents them from typing. In that particular situation, you have a trained operator who will listen to the speech of the person with the disability and be voice it clearly so that a hearing person can understand it, even if they are not trained in that particular type of voice. And by the way, that picture shows a person who founded the relay services in the United States for this particular type of disability. So, so far, I've explained to you what the relay services are and how they work. They are available in the United States, in Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, a few others. Not every type of relay service is available everywhere. And they all have one fundamental limitation, and that is that really it is the concept of making a phone call, which means you have to be able to dial a phone number and with another person that way. So in today's age, we do a lot more communication than only phone calls. We do a lot of video conferences. Um, we don't really call phone numbers all that often anymore during our everyday work. That's a major problem. So now I'm going to show you why. Okay, so in the next slide, you will see um, some work that we did in the past year where we evaluated a number of video conference and platforms for accessibility from a deaf and hard of hearing perspective. So I want to be very clear, this is not every accessibility feature, it's only about the types of features that are useful for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. So I don't expect you to read every detail, but to let me summarize, we compared 10 different video conferencing services for a total of 11 different accessibility features, such as the ability to provide caption, the ability to support sign language interpreters, the ability for deaf and hard of hearing people to communicate in sign language with each other, and so on. 
And the summary of that is basically that only about half of the test cases, 50%, um, have good accessibility features. Another 25% are inaccessible for a particular platform or a particular feature. And the remaining 25% are kind of the features there, but it doesn't really work the way we need it to, or it has some other problem. And those are the colors blue, red, and yellow, respectively. So I really want to drive the point home here that about half of all of the test cases that we have for accessibility, they fail in some way. So obviously that's a serious problem because like I said, most of the remote work today is being done through video conferencing and not through one-on-one -on -one phone call. So I also want to point out that in conjunction with relay services, the ability to call into a conference is really critical. Um, that particular column that we call relay service integration, um, that column is half blue and half yellow which means that in about half of the cases, there are some barriers for deaf and hard of hearing employees for calling in into a conference to get accessibility, even if um, they have access to a relay service. So Lydia already mentioned my favorite um, saying, which is that accessibility and video conferencing is about 20% technology and 80% behavior. So Lydia already described the standard for the behavior, how to run a remote meeting and how to make it accessible. But we cannot ignore those 20% and we have to do something about them as well. They're important too. And here we don't really have good standards yet. There's a big gap that we need to work on going forward. COVID-19, the pandemic really has shown us what works and what doesn't work in this area. So for future standards, we might have a little bit of work to begin with from both the European EN 301 and the American Section 508, but that can be only a starting point because many of these standards are also mostly focused on one-on-one -on -one communication whereas the development of modern video conferencing has been much more than what people imagined in those standards. All right, I will hand it over to Masahito now. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for your very uh, informative presentation. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Tom Pei of uh, WayMap, as well as uh, Chief Executive of the Rural Society of Blind Children. And he's been, um, he's the, an expert on audio navigation, as well as uh, uh, guidance for visually impaired people. And uh, we have worked together in ITU to standardize audio navigation uh, standards. So over to you, Tom. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Masahito. Uh, let me just... Right, I think, I've, have I got my video on? Um, okay, um, thank you very much. I, um, my name is Masahito, said it's Tom Pei. Um, I work with Waymap Limited. Um, and we worked for many years, as Masahito said, to develop audio-based navigation systems for blind and vision impaired people. The reason for that was that um, as the world developed um, and as accessibility to the outside world became more important, um, we found that in fact, uh, transport providers and other providers did not um, give a good accessible um, experience to um, So um, yeah, uh, so uh, I'm I'm really sorry my um, audio went off. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that the um, pandemic has um, you know has exposed a number of things in in terms of the um, uh, of accessibility 
and indeed um, a, a lot of inequality, and that it, not just uh, amongst um, uh, populations and races, but actually uh, probably even more markedly amongst the difference between uh, disabled and non-disabled people. Uh, there are four areas in particular that I just wanted to talk about um, very, very briefly. And one was um, is employment. You know, you you are probably three times more likely to be unemployed if you are a disabled person today than uh, uh, than your non-disabled peer. Um, as as well as that, you're probably twice as likely to be made redundant as part of COVID uh, and lose your job. Um, which indeed, um, you know, has a devastating impact on people. The second thing is in pay. Um, you, you are so about 75% of disabled people are on lower wages. So in other words, they are um, just above or uh, at a minimum wage level or sometimes even below. The next one is food insecurity. Um, in, in that respect, about 30% of disabled people uh, have said during COVID that they've got difficulty in getting to uh, the, to get to the grocery store to um, to get food, uh, and indeed um, you are twice as likely to be worried about uh, being able to pay for your weekly shopping if you're disabled. Um, the um, last thing is that is in, indeed in the other area is in transport. In this area, um, you know, the, the level of complaints that there are about accessibility to transport, even today and even in, in very developed countries, about 75% of disabled people talk about not having a, um, a pleasant experience um, and indeed cite um, access to uh, transport as being one of the great the greatest barriers to getting out and therefore um, one of the great causes of isolation in, um, in, in our society. So next slide please. Um, the, um, the upshot of that is that um, it is, um, is very clear that mobility matters. Uh, and and uh, this is um, more a case in the post-COVID era, era. Um, um, because it, I think if we just simply look at the moment at the experience of, um, of Washington DC, for instance, and the, the strategic plans that uh, Washington DC have for the post-COVID era. Um, Washington DC, um, you know, about, uh, they have got about um, 20 million visitors a year. Uh, they um, they have um, uh, probably about uh, seven hundred thousand people who work in DC and and uh, move around it. So, uh, so what they have at the moment is that they've got to start bringing people back into the city itself if the economy of the city is to survive. Um, although they do they do expect that there will be some reduction. They do think that that reduction will go away over three years. So actually they are putting a big, um, a, a, a lot of importance on access to public transport. And what I can say is that the, um, the standard that they are using for um, navigation for blind people is the ITU standard, which was um, which has subsequently been transcribed into a US standard, CTA 2076. So in other words, anybody who is going to um, use public transport in Washington DC will be able to experience a very accessible um, a journey if you were blind. We are currently working with the um, ITU um, uh, and on um, expanding this standard to cover people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities. And this will allow for people who, are, um, uh, who have um, uh, autism, uh, other neuro non-typical um, uh, and de de developmental uh, difficulties to be able to access public transport. 
And one of the early experiments that, um, that we did at Waymap was in Los Angeles, where we looked at what effect would this have on the disability community. And we found that if we can give people an accessible transport experience that is that can be accessed from their mobile phone uh, and it is easy to use and responds to their needs that 10 percent of the, of the disabled population will move from using paratransit facilities to public transport facilities therefore breaking down one of the great barriers to disabled people which is one of isolation and when we can access public transport, we can access better paying jobs, better housing, um, better, um, uh, better employment prospects, and indeed, hopefully, won't have that food insecurity of maybe not being able to pay for a week shopping at the end of the week. Thank you, Masahito, and back to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, very insightful presentation and now i'd like to move on to the last speaker presenter of this session is dr dushan sa he's the director of digitas institute and vice president of the institute for integrated inclusive communications in southeastern europe and he will be talking about accessibility policies in europe Okay, over to you, Dushan. Uh, yeah, thank you, Masahita. Oh, well, COVID-19 turned out to be a challenge, especially for persons with uh, sensory impairments. So we decided uh, to offer them help and invited them to participate in our activities. Uh, we offered them ICT solutions for their meetings and provided them support and training. So through these activities, through this partnership, we, were, we learned a lot about the needs and also about the environment um, that is provided to persons with disabilities. Uh, we, said we signed partnership agreements with several organizations from Slovenia and Croatia, uh, with experts who joined our team and also with um, academic institutions. Uh, we launched the ICT accessibility testbed to develop and test accessible ICT solutions targeted at deaf and hard of hearing communities. And a particular focus was on safe and secure solutions, uh, including those based on web RTC uh, technology. Deaf and hard of hearing persons, sign language interpreters and experts participated in testing solutions. Uh, such as video remote interpreting services, online meeting applications, and uh, language uh, technologies. Uh, the testbed activities <clears throat> were aimed at improving the understanding of functional and accessibility requirements of accessible ICT solutions and defining regulatory requirements for their deployment and for the betterment, of course, of the deaf and hard of hearing communities. We have also launched uh, awareness raising, capacity building, and training programs on accessible ICT solutions to meet COVID-19 challenges. We collaborated with our partners and local, regional, and national stakeholders. So we still um, develop new initiatives and new programs, especially in the accessible tourism. Uh, our activities uh, have been supported by extensive research work and in ICT accessibility. As part of our partnership with organizations of persons with disabilities, we offer them regulatory and policy support, which turned out to be of paramount importance, especially as two key EU ICT accessibility directives have been transposed into national laws during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also help with disabilities, um, persons with disabilities in getting better broadband packages to meet their increased need, which have uh, significantly increased during, during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, during the, uh, the last year, the pandemic, we have also uh, collaborated with the, the ITU in uh, carrying out the assessment of ICT accessibility across Europe. Um, so Europe 
is committed to implementation of the UN CRPD. Almost all countries have signed and ratified the CRPD and the majority have also signed and ratified its optional protocol. The situation is not that good with the Marrakesh Treaty though. Which, um, it has been signed by less than half of the countries and ratified by only a few of them. Well, the EU leads the way in ICT accessibility with its accessibility legislation primarily cons consisted of four directives, the Web Accessibility Directive, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, the European Electronic Communications Code and the European Accessibility Act, which, is, uh, which deals with accessibility of products and services. But we, we should not forget uh, both public procurement directives, which also uh, paved the way to better ICT accessibility in Europe. The implementation of the Web Accessibility Directive is a good example of how important are not only commitments, but also enforcement, monitoring and reporting. Almost all European countries have adopted or plan to adopt Web Accessibility laws or statutory requirements, but they have also improve the enforcement, monitoring and reporting. Uh, European countries have a good track record with universal service obligations, but there is still a long way to go to provide equitable access to electronic communication services, especially to emergency services and to emergency communications. Only 25% of the countries provide access to emergency services through applications and or relay services. So there is, um, way that <laughs> there is a lot of um, opportunities for persons with disabilities to improve their accessibility of electronic communications services. Uh, more challenges are in the area of accessibility of audiovisual media services where commitments and uh, practices significantly vary across Europe. We are yet to see the results of the implementation of the revised audiovisual media services directive but we can say that um, there is a big difference between countries who only implement basic requirements and those who have already uh, implemented uh, very strong requirements for the for accessibility of uh, audiovisual media services. Um, EU directives present present minimum requirements. Therefore, implementation of EU law into national legislation is very important. Uh, countries, countries need to improve policies, provide financial schemes to support ICT accessibility, designate government bodies to deal with ICT accessibility and coordinate across different government departments and improve enforcement and monitoring. For both strengths and commitments and improve capacity to implement, coordination mechanisms need to be put in place. Here, involvement of persons with disabilities is very important. So we helped um, organizations of persons with disabilities in, in this space with our uh, policy and regulatory support. And we will see the benefits uh, for them, I, I hope, uh, with the implementation of the two directives uh, this year, at least in Slovenia and, and Croatia. So cooperation and inclusion are key for ICT accessibility. We have learned that it is uh, very important to include persons with disabilities in all policymaking activities, as well as in products and service uh, development. Uh, here, we, we advocate for the inclusion of persons with disabilities in all stages of the product development from the, from the design stage. Uh, by involving persons with disabilities, we assure that uh, products and services uh, provide true equitable access to, to services, to products, to information and to communications. But uh, we also learned that we need to improve uh, digital skills of persons with disabilities, uh, which turned out to be um, very important during the pandemic. Uh, we engage in all these uh, activities and um, with our partners, we think that we can uh, improve uh, the situation at least in the region, but these activities are also important uh, throughout, throughout Europe and uh, worldwide. Uh, ITU uh, Europe office uh, last year, as I already mentioned, uh, carried out the assessment of ICT accessibility uh, in Europe. 
across all four directives mentioned before. And it provided uh, best practices uh, and recommendations for all stakeholders involved in uh, providing ICT accessibility. Uh, they're going to present the results uh, at Accessible Europe uh, in March. And I am looking forward uh, also uh, to participate in, in the events and uh, see how, how uh, ITU can improve, can, can uh, help countries and stakeholders um, improve the ICT accessibility uh, across Europe. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hidam. Thank you. Thank you, Dushan. Uh, very informative presentation. Thank you very much, uh, all presenters. So I'd like to invite everyone, every uh, presenter to show their face. And um, we'd like to start. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to discuss and um, uh, uh, come into some kind of uh, agreement and to come up with some takeaway message. So thank you very much. And um, the presentations are all good and uh, touch upon uh, many different aspects of ICT and accessibility in uh, during COVID-19. But as uh, Tom suggested, you know, and also as one of the, the themes of Zero Project this year, is employment for persons with disabilities. And um, I'd like to ask and invite opinions as to how ICT can help persons with disabilities in employment to, you know, to be being employed as well as, especially during this COVID-19 new normal situation. Uh, it has been very tough difficult for many people, including not just persons with disabilities, but for everyone, and how ICT can help them in general. And I, I can invite anyone uh, who wants to speak. So who wants to start? Tom, you want to say something more? Oh, you're muted. Great, right, I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much, Masahito. Yeah, uh, um, I mean, employment is the um, is the hub off of which um, integration uh, begins for those um, who um, who can uh, get outside their homes. Um, you know, employment doesn't necessarily just mean getting a job. It could be um, volunteering opportunities, but what it gives is the ability to interact with others. That's been taken away from us because of COVID, um, and indeed, without um, without the video conferencing technologies that we've got, uh, without the great work that was done by Lydia and Christian in um, in making uh, telephone relay services accessible, um, you know, um, you saw from myself actually working on accessible access uh, access to transport um, uh, and making that a, um, a possibility and a reality um, I think that um, what we what we would end up with if if that um, ICT was not available what we wouldn't have is that spark of hope that comes from the um, from, from a, a vision of the new normal the new normal, I think, is definitely is is. Uh, I think what we've learned is that the, uh, during this lockdown, that um, staying at home is there all of the time, and working from home all of the time is not going to be the way forward. The way forward is going to be a mixture of both. So it's going to be so important that we have um, dis disabled access in all forms of um, of technology so that we can access it from our home and from work and that it is as portable and as interop interoperable as possible. Without that, um, you know, we're just going to go back to the, the good old days of being cut off from the world. And I, don't, I think that um, uh, we've come too far to allow that to happen now. Okay, yeah, thank you. Dushan, uh, Lydia, okay, go ahead, Lydia. 
Um, I think it is a really interesting question how ICT can help. And Tom, you have put um, a kind of context of what we are now, and we are cannot com we cannot communicate with each other. One thing ICT has done, especially video conferencing, for those who are very skilled lip readers, it allows them to be able to talk to each other despite not being able to hear on the phone because phones are not fully accessible um, in the similar way as Christian, for example, um, presented today. So that's one thing. Another thing is, um, yes, there is an automated captioning which helps people to talk to each other on one-to-one -one basis. It can help, you can, correct the mistakes which automated captioning is doing when cap captioning is not coming right, when obviously one and another needs to write different words, whatever have been actually was supposed to say. The gold standard is definitely a human captioning, which the standard which we presented today has shown. But we cannot forget that for some people, automated captioning may also work. So it's about asking what works and what is um, the best um, possibility of communicating. I do think also there is another aspect, especially I see it with all the members in my association in UK. They also need to be fami to familiarize themselves with the technology. So that is another aspect, the educational aspect, which we need to, um, to implement. This is from me to give more um, chance of everybody to say. Okay, thank you very much. We have three more minutes to finish, I think. And uh, I'd like to invite Dushan, how policies can help in this respect. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kita. Well, I think that most people think that policies are boring, <clears throat> but after reviewing 46 countries and over 120 parameters uh, of ICT accessibility, we learned that uh, policy is, policies are very important. So. It is important how countries implement, um, for example, EU directives or other countries, uh, their own policies, their own laws. Um, it is important that, that uh, persons with disabilities are in, involved because um, legislators may not, may not understand you know, the difference between equitable access and accessibility. Sometimes services may be accessible, but they, they don't provide uh, equitable access. So we have to uh, teach them how to provide equitable access, how to uh, make uh, policies and, and laws, legislation that would um, strengthen equitable access. So this is, uh, I think, very important. And another thing that we also uh, have learned uh, are standards. We need to work uh, with persons with disabilities in development, in developing um, functional requirements and standards and communicate that with, uh, with the industry. So that they, well, it, they also have to be involved, of course, but uh, they have to understand also the requirements. So they either work with uh, ITU or directly with persons with disabilities and develop better products and better services. So I, I think that these are very important things, especially as Tom mentioned, uh, the new normal will be a mixture of both of ICT I mean, work, working from home through ICT and uh, working uh, at, at work, at, at normal work. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we're running out of time, so I, I have to, or we have to say some takeaway, <laughs> some words, final words. So I thank you very much, first of all. And um, I think we have touched upon many, uh, relevant issues and absolutely important issues, especially the use of ICT is essential and so that we can go back to the good old times. And also um, uh, we have to consider policies, how they can be applied, right? And, and also we have to think of standards so that um, it's not just a fragmented market, but people harmonize and consolidate it to uh, push forward the new kind of horizon in which uh, persons with disabilities as well as you know other people, anyone, everyone can join in the society which is accessible as well as inclusive, which also of course includes 
um, employment. So I, with that, I'd like to close the session and um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, all the participants and all the, the viewers and also Zero Project for uh, letting